go a little something like this. Hit it. Like I said, I don't mean to, but I will. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Who should we begin with first? Oh, I know. They keep finding more documents that Biden didn't know he had. It's becoming quite a problem for Scranton's favorite lad. They find them in an office. They find them in a garage. If he belonged to the loyal order of the moose, they'd find him at his lodge. Larry Schultz is not deterred, and he's not being a Biden chump. Larry says when it comes to having classified documents, nobody beats Donald Trump. (laughs) Great to be here. Good to have you, Mr. Schultz. Yeah. Pleasure having you in our premise. He's in the Mike Height seat once again this week, hanging with the Friday Five. That puts his streak of Friday Fives at two, and it keeps his streak alive. Last week, he brought to our attention a county ordinance that was a nuisance and a process that wasn't so much transparent, but known more for its translucence. He bring, he's bringing it today, and soon he'll add another tool because next year at this time, Alonzo Perry will be in law school. Oh, I like that. I like that. I'll have four lawyers on the show at that point. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just have to invent stuff to argue about. He's watching the state legislature and following closely each and every minute to see what the House will pass, the Senate will reject, and ultimately how they'll spin it. Take that tax cut bill, for instance, 30% now and 50% someday. A bill the Senate says upon arrival is considered DOA. Joe Ferretti watches to see who holds the straw that stirs the drink. Is it Justice Blair or Hanshaw? Who will be the first to blink? Good morning, Joey. (laughs) Good morning. Introducing our third attorney on the roster, Mike Carl is his name. He's an expert on taxes and he knows how to play the game. He can minimize your tax bill and make it go away. He can argue before the Supreme Court. He can do it all the day. He can argue about anything, and he can do it no matter where he's at. But there's one thing Mike Carl can't do, and that's vote for a Democrat. (laughs) Well said. (laughs) This next one I want to apologize to all of you in advance for, but I couldn't resist it. He eyeballs it all with interest as they haggle over stuff. Republicans digging in on one side and Biden calling bluff. And in Charleston, it's not much different with tax cuts in the air. Justice in the House on one side and on the other, Craig Blair. Still, Bill Stubblefield awakens each day and takes his dogs for a walk. And each day that he takes them, he swears those dogs can talk. (laughs) To prove it, Bill will tell them that each and every day is tough. And when he asks them how their world is, the answer is always rough. <laughs> You're good, Rob. You're good. I did, I did apologize in advance for that one. And I, uh, and listening yesterday, I understand Maria wants her introduction she, as well. She wants yeah. her own, a yeah. private intro on so, a non-Friday. Yeah, so maybe you should start doing that as a matter of routine. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's begin, uh, speaking of routine, with issue number one, our lead-off hitter, Joe, Joey Torts Ferretti. Rob, I, uh, recalling last week's show, we did touch on the issue of the Berkeley County Nuisance Ordinance that was proposed and immediately shot down by uh, at least a lot of folks on Twitter and Facebook. And I also watched with interest uh, your interview of the uh, – uh, County Council and, and Alan Davis, the administrator, uh, who seem to be a little bit in retreat on their effort to uh, address nuisances in Berkeley County. So I wanted to bring the subject back up because I think uh, having now reviewed that proposed ordinance myself and, and being a little bit more conversant about it, I'm trying to figure out what the big deal is here. Uh, re- back in 12th century England, Uh, A nuisance was declared by the king. You were issued a criminal citation, and you either fixed it or you lost your property. And, uh, you know, we've come a long way since then in terms of due process and and our property rights. And as I look at this ordinance, I see the protections there for property rights and due process. So I'm wondering what the real concern is here. We have issues in the county. That's beyond question. We have drug houses. We have dilapidated buildings. We have uh, situations where people don't take care of their property. It's just the way things are in communal living. And so what we have to do is figure out a way to self-govern, to protect what for many of us is the largest investment we'll make in our lives, which is our property. So how do we do that? Well, the county council has proposed this ordinance. And as I look at it, there's a complaint process. 
there's an appeal process, there's due process, there's the involvement of the courts, and there's a clear statement in the law that the burden of proof in all actions taken by the county and this committee that would govern nuisances, that they, those folks carry the burden of proof. And you get your day in court if you, don't, if you feel they are not acting appropriately. The alternative is to have no ordinance and to leave it to the people of this, this county to enforce through self-help remedies, such as hiring a lawyer and filing something in the courts and running the state law and claiming there's a nuisance. That's expensive, and oftentimes it's not very productive, especially if you're trying to chase down out-of-state property owners. All we're looking to do is empower our local county officials to do the work for us, to represent us, which is what we put them in office to do. So I propose that this is a worthy endeavor by county council. It should not be abandoned. And I would hope that with a lot of input from the public, we could devise the scheme by which we could govern ourselves. So that's my proposal. I want to know what others think. All right, I want to start with the person shaking his head no first in the room, and that would be Alonzo Perry. Where government moves in, community retreats. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time. Where government moves in, community retreats. And what this does is not what it's, you know, it's an expedited practice for something that's already done. You know, our constitution has you know talked about the importance of property ownership and so much so that even in cases of eminent domain where there's you know uh, uh, the government is usurping public or private property for public use uh, there's an appraisal you know there's a payment for it the government shouldn't create some system in which they can steal property not pay you and uh, basically create a system of unlimited power to enter your property. And um, I, I think that, you know, it's troubling. One of the uh, statements you made in remarks to the, uh, the notion that people are incapable of, you know, filing their own order for civil, you know, uh, courts. And I'm sure that there are remedies through that system as opposed to uh, what you're proposing, which is making the government your neighbor, creating a county HOA. And um, I, I, I think that you're mischaracterizing exactly what the ordinance is uh, proposing. Joe, you are welcome to respond now unless you want to wait till the end. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly wait to the end, except to say that uh, in reading the ordinance, uh, we, there, there is clear due process. But uh, the, the point about uh, I mischaracterize what a private property owner can do, uh, what I'm characterizing is the cost associated with that effort. Uh, what, we're, what the scheme does is allow the county government and its resources and its elected officials, people we put in office, to enforce the law rather than have private enforcement through civil actions, which uh, maybe Mr. Perry doesn't know yet because he's not a practicing lawyer, but it is expensive to do that. And a lot of people don't have the wherewithal to do that, but they do have the ability to contact their elected officials, the people they pay taxes to, to support and ask them to take action. And that's what this ordinance does. This ordinance makes the county the actual judge uh, for this uh, present issue. Um, this is a kangaroo court. This is saying that there is some ex officio court that's being established in order for them to determine whether that dilapidated property should be allow them to alter, improve, vacate, remove, close, clean up, or demolish your property. It doesn't have it speak to a judge. And I don't know what part of the provision um, in the actual public nuisance order that you see that says that. It gives the uh, ability to um, use the power of the sheriff's department and the court that they set up with some director, some bureaucrat that is basically given the tools of a judge in order to, you know, uh, officiate this matter. And that's not uh, an appropriate way of uh, determining the legalese. That's why it's important for it to go to the courts. And if this ordinance is passed, it's going to be far harder for us to ever remove it than 
if uh, we were to just allow this motion to pass because there's a benefit for judges that want to lower their case dockets. There's an incentive there. And we have to be careful of what incentives we're creating. You know, uh, good intentions often pave, you know, the road to hell. So I, I don't see this being a, a thing that people support because there's a dramatic shift in the power dynamic and people aren't allowed to um, protect their own property. Let me go to the former county commission president in Berkeley County, the Honorable Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, question for Joe first. When you referenced 12th century property rights, were you were at, thinking I was there at the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, I knew you'd be able to draw upon your experience, Bill. So, uh, I, that's why I went back that far. But, uh, you know, that, 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 I, the comparison is apt, okay? I mean, we, we had a king... We had a king who declared nuisances. Now we have courts. And, and, and contrary to what Mr. Perry just said, there is an appeal to the circuit court. And I think our circuit court judges would take great offense to being called kangaroo courts. Yeah. I was going to pick up on that as well. I I uh, have a problem when we invoke inflammatory descriptors such as what was just done with the county commission with being a kangaroo court. I just I, I don't think that's appropriate at all. Uh, I there's few things that evoke as much emotion as property right discussions. We saw that with zoning, uh, and uh, is zoning necessary? Uh, Probably most folks would say in certain instances it is. Uh, this is the same place. Uh, do we need to protect, uh, do we need to have certain standards that we reach up to? Uh, I think we probably do uh, to protect the uh, community as a whole. Uh, but, but what this does is to move the council members into areas that they do not want to be in. And that is to uh, uh, create a very controversial element within the county that they have to address. Uh, probably the safest thing to do in this is to, instead of developing an ordinance, is to develop a referendum. Uh, and they could pass, they could put that on the ballot for the county as a whole to address. And and they may well do go this way. I don't know if they will or not, but that's what I would suggest. Uh, uh, but I do, uh, uh, I I regret that we we find reasons to label things in a deflammatory manner, which I don't think serves any purpose at all. To bring this issue down through its anchor leg, I've got two attorneys on opposite ends of the table, and I mean that in every way possible, ladies and gentlemen. Larry Schultz, you go first. Sure. Um, th there is a problem in Martinsburg with um, dilapidated buildings, buildings that are not being kept up to any kind of presentable thing. Um, and that affects the value of the property right next door. Certainly that does, as we, as Alonzo says, as we sit here right now, that gives that next door property owner a legal right um, to go forward. What we are saying is, just like you have the legal right to go forward when you're in a car wreck, uh, you have the police show up and they do an investigation that both sides rely upon to the extent that it helps them when they try the case. We also can, at any time, inject the government into this and say, we're going to have inspectors who will come out and determine, is this building dilapidated or is it fooling you? It just looks dilapidated. Uh, is there a problem? Could it fall over? Is it a fire hazard? Etc. Bringing the government's... Um, um, agents in to examine the situation um, is not a breach of anybody's rights. Uh, they have to follow the Constitution like anyone else. I confess I have a little bit of problem with setting up a separate court uh, to handle this stuff. I don't think we necessarily need a separate court to do it. But with that minor amendment, um, you know, I can see why the circuit judges would like there to be a separate court because it could be, at the beginning, a lot of uh, involved litigation. But once you go along, um, that will die down like it always does when you pass a law and enforce it. And eventually you'll see a cleaner city that's um, doing a better job of, of, you know, not allowing a business owner who suddenly gets addicted to opiates and his whole life falls apart, including the business, 
and the building starts falling down, we don't let that person drag us down with them. Um, when you're next door to that property, you're saying, holy cow, what, you know, what do I do now? <laughs> and you may not have the funds to do it, but the city has an interest of its own. Not just in the value of your property, but in the value of all the properties in the community. And it, it hurts. It can hurt growth a great deal. When you're you know, talking about city, you're talking about the county in this case. Is, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, 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 but the community has an interest of its own. You know, when my daughter went to Temple University, uh, people said, well, where is Martinsburg? Nobody ever heard of Berkeley Springs. So her friend said, well, where is Martinsburg? And she showed them. And she said, you know, some people call it the, the Baltimore of West Virginia. And they said, what? Because their view of West Virginia was this bucolic trout fishing state, you know, where this is where you go to get away from all that. Which, which is like, true what? for much of the state. Yes. yes. Um, and so the perceptions of people in other places can have a big effect on you uh, as a state, as a community, uh, especially when you're so close to those other places. You know, Philadelphia is not that far from here, and there's other big cities even closer. And if Martinsburg wants to thrive as a tourist destination, as a place for business to come, then you have to put on a, a, a show of doing a good job of patrolling the, the sort of madness that occasionally rises up in certain blocks. And, um, and to be I, clear, I the, the city's done that already, and, yes. and the argument now is at the county yeah, level, yeah. which at this point does not appear to be much more of an argument because when Jim Whitaker, the council president, was on this week, he said it's pretty much a dead issue right now. Yeah. yeah. Mike Carl. Now, I have to ask a question before I start to talk about it. <clears throat> the city of Martinsburg, has it taken an official position on this politically? It, it, it has, and I kept saying city, but, but it no, is the county, too. No, no, but I'm yeah. saying, has the city of Martinsburt taken a position on The city has on, a, on, a public nuisance. No. no huh? But not, but, but not, not on the, the county. Not, not on the county. I know we're not on no, this yeah, initiative. I don't no, think so. They have not. Okay, have well, because I, <clears throat> as my firm represents the city, I couldn't. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to recuse yourself, <laughs> I, 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 Counselor. <laughs> that's, uh, that's good. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm... Yeah, generally very conservative but i but i do i do think that this is a a matter of degree that will actually improve the process and and it won't just be ad hoc uh you know individual uh you know litigation thing it'll be it'll it'll have more of a of a established process so i I, i'm generally supportive of it I believe that if it just passed, there would be a certain amount of cleanup that took place right away. But if the, because they'd be saying, "Oh, no, no, I'm not going to wait around for that," I, I do. I, I do agree with Bill though that a referendum would be the the, yeah. the real clean way to do it. I mean, the, the, I will say one more thing, and that's just that we have to understand that much of social history for the last three decades in America has been replacing uh, what works with what sounds good. And I deal in, you know, the facts and not ideas. And it's the language in this bill that is destructive. You know, something that reasonably annoys allows them to enter your the, the domain of your house without a warrant. That is the reality. The reality is that community moral standards is what they used to justify the usurpation of people's property. And that is incorrect. That is not a, a positive way to move forward. There are methods already in place, and what this does is expedite the ability for government to uh, essentially play a role that I don't believe members of our community would want. Billy, let's, let's frame this the way it, I think it should be, or actually was. This was initially proposed by the county council as they do in every case, and it was very narrow in scope, very, very narrow, and uh, what they wanted to do. As they should do, as they do do, they sent it out to various groups to, to review and to add to it if they feel appropriate. During this review process, several additional provisions were added, and when it got back to the county council for them to take action, they were unhappy with it. 
they felt it was an overreach. As Alan Davis said, it went through the lawyers, and then when it came back, it well, was unrecognizable. It, it went through more than the lawyers. Right, but the lawyers yeah. were the last stage. La lawyers were the last stage, but they went through two or three other review groups. And so when it came back to the county council, based upon what I've heard from the county council, it was not the public, uh, the social media that gave them calls. It was not the, their perceived pushback because that was from a very vocal group. Was that a minority? Was that a majority? I don't know. Social media, it's hard to, hard to tell. It's the, the county council felt that the bill they had in front of them was far in excess of what they wanted to do and they were comfortable with. So that's why they said they're not going to take any action on it right now. I don't think you need to be a, a 50 years experience state legislator to figure out that one way that you can kill a bill is by overdoing it. When you go into a man, instead of saying, oh, we're going to cut this all out, you add a whole bunch of other stuff that takes it way over the line, and then nobody likes it. Yeah, but, but Larry, <laughs> that, that kind of uh, frames in a different way as well. That, what you said implies that the, uh, the county council deliberately overreached so they would have a reason to take it back. That was not the case. It, through the review process, provisions were added on that the county council were not happy with, so that's when they decided not to take action but those provisions that got added on that the county council is not happy with are perhaps in the view of a majority of the citizens the very problem with the ordinance i have no idea it, or the, the in other words sometimes you can amend something to death and it's easier than fighting against it yeah. is all i'm saying you could try to cut the guts out of it when it comes to you or you could say oh oh you want to come in there and control people's property we're going to have a dandelion count you know, or whatever. <laughs> 11 are permitted, 12 not. <laughs> Joe Peretti, final minute comes back to you. Well, as is often the case when it comes to practical matters, Bill Stubblefield is correct. I believe uh, the county council members don't want to handle this hot potato. It is politically charged, and so that there's a, a great threat of them not doing anything, uh, having floated this trial balloon and, and seeing the backlash. But, again, I, I go back to something Alan Davis said, Rob, in your interview earlier this week. Uh, the authority of this with county government derives from the state code. It's Volume 7 of the West Virginia Code, clearly laying out the powers that local governments have. But they can only act through ordinances. And what was attempted here was to set out a scheme in clear as language as possible as to what the county government can do with regard to nuisances, with appeal rights and due process rights all the way through our circuit court level. So it, it, it was a means to an end of trying to clean up the county. You drive around, I think a lot of people would admit there's areas of the county that do need addressed, and what's been happening so far is not effective. This was a means of trying to uh, do something different, and I hope the county government will continue to look at this issue with public input, as I stressed, to do what needs to be done. And, uh, Bill, a Facebook question from Faith Hall says, was Bill Stubblefield involved in writing this ordinance? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, Faith, I was not. <laughs> but but, but what, we, what we've learned from this discussion, and yes, last week, some week before that, we need to devote a full hour to Joe Ferretti's issues. <laughs> Joe? <laughs> Which issues are you talking about in particular? <laughs> Joe's, Joe's personal issues. issues. Personal yeah, yeah, issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now there's did, fodder for an ordinance, I, I, baby. I, I did not say that, Joe. That was your buddy Larry. <laughs> we move on with the Friday Five show. In studio with us, uh, we have Larry Schultz, attorney at law. Good morning again, Larry. Thanks so much for being here. I love coming to this place. It's great. <laughs> I could tell by the enthusiasm in your voice when you said that. I thought that was Stephen Wright for a second. <laughs> also, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Good morning again, Rob. Uh, attorney at law, Michael Carl. Good morning. And soon to be attorney at law, Alonzo Perry. Oh, let's hope. Let's hope. All right. And uh, attorney at law, Joe Ferretti. I feel like I've done something wrong. I'm yeah. surrounded by the <laughs> Supreme Court here. What's going on? <laughs> I'm argue my case and try to get a, a three-to-one yeah. vote here. Uh, on the clock, number two, Bill Stubblefield, you're up. 
Okay, to borrow from a 12th century Chinese curse, <laughs> may, may, and I was there, Joe. Do I got to get the mute button ready? <laughs> right. yeah. May we live, and may you live in interesting times, and we certainly do. And one of the more interesting um, uh, questions we have today is raising the U.S. debt uh, 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 level. Uh, we have this every few years. Uh, last time that we really became... Uh, quite threatening was 2011 uh, when the Republicans were trying to use uh, voting against raising the debt ceiling against the Obama administration uh, to get some concessions out of the Obama administration. And they were successful. Uh, they do, uh, it appears they're doing the same thing this time, that they they realize they have to pass eventually the debt ceiling. If we do not, it's going to have devastating results. Uh, uh, it would uh, increase our interest payments on debts, uh, Medicare, Social Security, VA benefits, military pay, uh, would, could all be um, uh, be jeopardized. Uh, their air traffic control, border control, school lunches, the whole bit uh, uh, could be jeopardized if we did not raise the debt ceiling level. But the uh, the Republicans are using this as a vehicle uh, to uh, uh, to cut back on on uh, uh, our nation's spending, which I think is we, sh- we should do, uh, but probably there are better ways to do it. Uh, the, gov- uh, the GOP uh, have certain prioritization in mind, but they have not said yet what they are because of political pushback. Uh, but whatever happens, when the House proposes, the Senate's got to agree to it and the president has to approve. My question is, I guess one more thing before the question. I think both folks are playing who blinks first. Uh, the if the government if we did go into reneging on our debt ceiling on our debt, uh, who's going to be blamed? The administration or the uh, or the House representatives. I think that will be hashed out in the uh, the uh, court of public opinion. The question is to distinguish lawyers and lawyers to be is what are we going to do in these interesting times when it comes to raising the debt ceiling? All right. So, and, and by the way, we've uh, Thursday hit the debt limit. So what they're doing now is diverting my wife's uh, <laughs> retirement money into paying for whatever it needs paid for today, basically, is what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah, all right. So we'll start first with Larry Schultz. Lawrence. I believe that, um, as Bill says, even the crazy caucus of the Republican Party, um, that smaller group of people who don't seem to care about very much, even they will be persuaded if they understand uh, th- that the that the entire credit rating of the United States of America is affected here, and we you might be playing with something that'll make a mess for a long time. I believe in the end they will, as Bill says, cave and and raise the and and agree to raise the debt ceiling. Um, this is not the time when when you're on a when you're on a debt ceiling uh, crash, that's not the time to sit down and make decisions about the future of American debt. Um, you have to keep the, uh, you know, don't let them start foreclosure proceedings before you try to get control of your finances. Get control of your finances over time. But in the meantime, if you got to borrow a little more money, do it. Um, so I think that eventually even the... Matt Gates Club, uh, for want of a better term, will see this and will say, okay, we got to do something. It's also possible that Kevin McCarthy will be able to cobble together a large group of Republicans and a few Democrats uh, on his side to get to the 50% plus one he needs uh, to pass the raising of the debt ceiling. Mike Carl. <clears throat> well, it's, a, it's an interesting process for sure. And, and the, the best way for the Republicans is to take control of the White House and both houses of the Congress, and then they don't have this problem. But it, it's, it's a process, you know, a trade-off deal that, that, that has worked in the past, as you pointed out, when Obama's uh, tenure. And, and so uh, – but, but I, I basically agree with what 
Larry said that, that I think that uh, eventually they they will they will avoid default, but I I think eventually <clears throat> there will be some adjustments. Probably not all that we need, but there'll be there'll be some. Uh, adjustments agreed to. They don't have to do anything till June, I think, as I understand it. Uh, they can defer this and kick it down the road until then. Will it go until June? Oh, I think there's a good chance it'll go close to the end, yeah. That, right. That's a whole leverage of the of the issue. Alonzo? Uh, I, I think that we're not even truly encapsulating this, this problem. And I just want to uh, go through the numbers really quick. So, uh, we have a $31 trillion debt. And it's, it's incomprehensible. Your brain can't even process, you know, a trillion dollars. If we were to convert dollars into seconds, right, a million dollars is 12 days. One billion dollars is 31 years. One trillion dollars is 31,000 years, over 31,000 years. And that's 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 ridiculous this is not sustainable to continue to say oh well let's push up the debt ceiling let's keep raising money we need to pay our bills we're pushing this off on our future families and uh, I've been listening to representative Swikart, um who has I mean just been blowing the whistle you know saying that this is existential uh, the fact that you know uh, most of our capital is just going to mandatory spending already that increases every year without us even touching it is is terrifying you know there's one day where there's going to be no discretionary spending to buy any more entitlement programs or to continue down this path and uh we'll just be paying bills and uh this government won't be able to function whether uh we lead to a sovereign default or not so um the main message is you know the house needs to really emphasize that we need to start paying our bills and i mean at least you know start to reverse this way and i hope democrats can you know um, understand the nature of how significant this is but i i'm not hopeful for that so joe ferretti well i agree with alonzo we have to pay our bills and that's what the debt ceiling represents is, is past due bills and if you don't pay them just like you don't pay your mortgage uh, you're bound to lose a lot. And, uh, you know, this country can't stand to lose what uh, would happen if we default. Uh, so these folks arguing for default, are, are, I think, are are, are really just uh, demagoguing the issue. Uh, it's going to happen. It is a fact that this debt ceiling will be extended. It's just a question of when and, and the timing of it uh, and what an impact it's going to have on our markets and our credit rating and things of that nature. Politically, remember back in 2011 when this game was played, this, that was on the heels of the Democrats getting shellacked in 2010 in the midterms. Uh, one of the worst beatings the Democrats have ever taken in terms of midterm elections. In 2011, the Republicans shut down the government, played this game, and some would argue it put Obama on track to get reelected in 2012. So I hope the Republicans learn a lesson here. Don't play with this. Yeah, you can argue very forcefully and very legitimately that we've got a spending problem, but when bills are due for money you've already spent, you got to pay them. Bill, at, it comes back to you. Yeah, at the risk of sounding partisan, and I don't really mean for this way, but Mike Carl said that the best way to resolve this is to have in this case, Republicans in charge of all branches of the government. Uh, the last time we did that was where we saw the greatest jump in debt ceiling hike. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's not to say that it's not been throughout, but the greatest jump was in those first two years of President Trump. Mike, I know you're smiling or smirking. Yeah. It's one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that is partisan. And and and, yeah. and 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 uh, if I had the time, I'd go back and and rebut it with other incidents that went the other way. You you heard yeah. that on yeah. CNN or something? <laughs> no, 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 But you're right, Mike. There's many That's, other examples that would support your side. I, I yelled. That, thank but, you but, for but acknowledging in, that. In this <laughs> in this particular case, uh, it, 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 that can be demonstrated. Okay. Uh, usually there. 
there's eggs and waffles flying on Thursday morning <laughs> right. when this yeah. discussion we, takes place. We have, right? mo- we have the most wonderful discussions. <laughs> and, and at least eggs and waffles, Mike gets on the edge of his chair, starts jumping up and down, gets red in the face, <laughs> and then somebody throws him some more red meat, and he goes a little bit more. It's a... You're a good friend, Mike, and well, I enjoy, appreciate, enjoy these appreciate your leadership. The, 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 the time, the time to deal with the, the, that, there's a there's a lot in that statement. Yeah. The, the time to deal with the debt ceiling should be when you're setting the budget. Exactly right. That is exactly right. That's the point that make it, and that I think is what the Democrats hope to do now, is to influence the the setting of the of next year's budget. Because, they, as you pointed out, there's nothing we can do now. Uh, constitutionally, they have to pass the debt ceiling. But they can use as leverage to set next year's budget. And they have to also do what Trump did, which was to lower the taxes on everybody and raise their government's revenues because of the stimulus effect of the tax cut. I noticed when you made that statement, you kept looking up at Larry like, when's he going to interrupt me? <laughs> Larry didn't take the bait. All right, that's the final word. Bill, we move on to issue number three with Alonzo Perry. So I imagine we don't want to go back to any of the county issues. So um, I want to just ask everyone on the panel, is Governor's Justice's 50% income tax deduction going to pass? Is it a scheme for his Senate campaign and not sustainable for the state as State Senator um, Finance Chair Senator Tarr says? All right, so there's your question about the tax cut bill. Joe Ferretti, I'm going to begin with you. Well, I can't help but think uh, that this rift that exists between Senators Tarr and Blair and the governor are are, are clouding everybody's judgment about the viability of cutting our personal income taxes 50%. Underlying all this, though, is the clear message from our Senate in West Virginia that they desperately want to cut personal property taxes, equipment, inventory, machinery. They want to cut those taxes. They've been wanting to do that for years. They're trying to figure a way to do it. And the governor spoiled the party when they wanted Amendment 2 to pass. So there's a rift about that, too. And now... The governor comes forward with a 50 percent cut that the House endorses, and the Senate knows they can't cut personal income taxes by 50 percent and also get what they want. So it's going to be a question of whether or not the Senate can craft a bill that the House can swallow and that the governor will accept, which cuts taxes across the board in all categories, albeit not at levels that the governor and the House are now proposing. That's the only way I see this is going to work. I feel that in talking with a couple of legislators, they know the pressure is on. They must cut taxes this session. They can't crow about all this money that the state's sitting on and not cut taxes. So they're going to have to do it. They're going to have to work out a compromise. I just wonder if the personalities of people like uh, Mr. Tarr will allow that to happen. Larry Schultz. Um, I I think that a 50% income tax cut ought to be dead on arrival. And the reason I say that is we have a progressive income tax um, in place. And so when you cut it by substantial amounts, that cut is by necessity regressive. And 50 bucks is about what some 20 percent of a of west virginians will get that's what they'll say 50 bucks whereas at the other end of the scale as is often the case with income tax cuts there will be um pretty big numbers thousands and thousands of dollars for the wealthiest west virginians i know that Mr. Carl and and others in the Republican Party believe that every time you cut a rich man's taxes, why it's just great for everybody. Um, I would suggest that those people getting targeted with a $50 tax cut, if people like them and with a little higher incomes than them got more money in this economy, they would spend it. They wouldn't. Um, purchase retirement stocks and uh, ship them off to some foreign country where they could duck the taxes, they would spend the money. 
and that would be retail money coming into the hands of small businesses all over this state. So to the extent that you don't do that, what you're saying is, okay, we won't charge you as much taxes uh, for the privilege of running your business and making a lot of money here, and good luck, you can save this money um, anywhere you want, and you don't have to invest it in anything uh, having to do with West Virginia. I don't think that's going to be good for this state in the long term. I would recommend any money businesses save they use to buy advertising on this show, but that's just my personal bias. <laughs> Billy? Yeah, I think this reduces down to two points, and that's politics and personal relationships. As far as politics goes, uh, Larry's made some good points. I don't think the, the merits of one plan over the other is what's driving this. A 50% tax cut plays well politically. And I think this screen is already moving down the tracks, and I think it's going to, it has so much steam, uh, it's going to pass. The question is, will the personal animosities that is developed between the Senate leadership and the governor come into play and try to slow passes this bill. I don't think they can. I think there's momentum is there that the Senate knows uh, that they're going to have, that there's so much uh, uh, momentum coming at them, they're going to have to respond to it, and I think it will pass. But there's going to be a lot of smoke uh, raised in the meantime, one of which is, is it affordable? Can we afford a 50% tax cut? Now, the governor's uh, financial advisor, David Hardy, has made taken great effort the last couple of so weeks, spelling out practically to every penny that we have coming in and going out, and Hardy makes the argument, yes, we can afford it. Senate Finance Chair Eric uh, uh, Tarr says, nope. We cannot afford it. So uh, that's going to be the case. But I do think it's going to pass because of the political momentum that is built up. Mike Carl, former tax commissioner of the great state of West Virginia. Well, I, I, I agree broadly, <laughs> not specifically, uh, that, that, that something will pass. But I, I, I think it will involve multi-year adjustments, which even, even Justice's proposal was multi-year for, for the phase in of the 50 percent but uh in, in not only in income tax but in personal property tax and i think that's going to be part of the picture it's going to be a multi-year thing and uh there 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 will be uh some kind of immediate you know tax relief but it'll be uh, also, more tax relief will be phased in and it'll have multi facets to it. It won't just be personal income tax. Could, uh, yes. uh, Mike said something uh, key to thought. Uh, one of the things that is missing from this and that was in Eric Householder's original proposal are triggers. I would like to see triggers embedded that we have to meet a certain level before we go to the next stage. And, and the House uh, uh, amendment or committee substitute. Ha does recognize that. In fact, there's already <clears throat> a statutory arrangement, a fund that's already been established, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, the householder, you know. $700 million. Put, put, well, but no, that, that's no, not no, true. No, the, the, the fund itself that's managing that $700 million has already been established in the law. So so this, this isn't, you know, I mean. But, but with triggers, Mike? Are the triggers like uh, what was originally before? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Eric? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, I, and they may amend the triggers, but the, the, that concept is, is in there. Alonzo, comes back to you. So I'm just worried that this is, you know, uh, Governor Justice, you know, being politically expedient. You know, I mean, this would be a big win for him. And I, I'm worried that, you know, he's setting us up for failure. You know, um, he campaigned against Amendment 2, which was a $600 million cut and is proposing about a $1.2 billion cut. And that's what uh, Senator Tarr was bringing up. How can we afford this if you were campaigning against this? And so I, I wouldn't dismiss, you know, the Senate Finance Committee um, in, you know, just pushing back against this uh, due to personalities or animosity towards the governor. I think that, you know, there's a genuine question here that they need to provide. And um, Secretary David Hardy just, I mean, he got ripped apart talking to the actual Senate Finance Committee. And I think that, you know, it speaks volumes about um, the direction that we're headed in. And uh, I actually, for once, uh, 
agree with the Senate that that maybe we should take a deeper look into this. And I want to see, you know, how we um, can can screw a significant tax relief while not putting, you know, us in jeopardy or having to raise taxes here in the next four years because we only can project out to three years seeing that this tax cut will be backfilled. There's an interesting dynamic at play here as well, and that is that Senator and Senate President Craig Blair prior to this session said, if we're going to go with an income tax cut, it's got to be a big one to make a difference. I'm not voting for anything that's not at least 50%. The thought then when the House passed the 50% was that they were calling Craig's bluff on the 50%. That's what the rumor going around the Capitol was as it was being related to me. Okay, Now, but the Senate has left themselves with an out here on on Craig saying we'll do 50% or, or we won't approve it at all. And that is this. They've released this, uh, a, a statement that they don't trust the projections made by Revenue Secretary Hardy of $1.8 billion a year for the next three years. Their out is they don't trust those numbers. And if they don't trust those numbers, then they can, in good conscience, go ahead with a 50% income tax cut. Does that give them an out on this? Well, it, it, it makes them more rational. Uh, and... and uh, th- and that's part of this trigger thing with with the with the surplus fund and 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 all that 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 will you know it's a little bit of wait and see. But I I think I think they're going to uh, include some real sophisticated economic uh, studies and projections that will uh, support uh, a scheme, but still has still has triggers. And and back to the. Think about the personalities. I, <clears throat> I think the tension between the House and the Senate leadership is way overstated. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, justice may try to uh, exploit the perception of it, but I don't think it's nearly. Uh, and 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 my favorite scenario is that that the Senate comes up comes back with this you know more sophisticated, uh, per, including personal property tax relief, wait and see, you know, triggers and all that. And and the House embraces it broadly, and they pass it, and and uh, Justice vetoes it, and they override his veto. That <laughs> that that would be the most beautiful scene to me. Yeah, uh, and again, I want to pick up on what Mike <laughs> Mike Mike said. I think Mike's making a very good point. The winner of all this is going to be the House. Roger Hanshaw. They have appeared to be the the, the adult in the room, and the personality conflict is most between the governor and the Senate leadership and not the House. I will disagree with Mike on whether or not the relationship between the Senate and the governor is overblown. I don't know no. that it is. No, he, no. He said the House. He said, I the, said house. the House. He didn't know the, oh, the closeness the house. of the, the House okay. and the yeah, Senate. That's I right. missed that. That's, that's overblown. Yeah, that's right. Because oh, no, no. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, if, if Blair feels about uh, justice the way I do, it, he, it's not and overblown. And he does. And, and more importantly, <laughs> His finance chairman, Eric Tarr, does, because not only did he say they didn't trust those numbers, but then he went on to say the governor has shown in the past, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he'll do anything to, to get his his way on, on uh, and say anything and do anything and then change his mind entirely the next day if it suits him. Uh, they don't have any faith in this guy having their backs if they stick their necks out because he's left them hanging before. And, yeah, no kidding. His record it absolutely supports that skepticism. He supported personal property tax relief for years before that he supported half a billion dollar deficit spending the first year his first budget and and fortunately he was smart enough to you know accept that the house or the republican legislature said no to that all right alonzo final final word goes back to you i the only thing i have to say is that i think that um i i agree with the senate finance committee the thing that uh, David Hardy had addressed or gave phony math. Phony math. And that's all I'm going to say. 